Thanks everybody for coming out on a school night um, and such a big turnout too. This is actually a really big thrill for me. Um, it's nice to see everyone here. My name is Brian. I work with TenGen. Um, I have contributed to the Java driver for MongoDB. And um, most recently, currently, I'm a consulting engineer. So um, I go out to companies with production deployments of MongoDB and help them um, troubleshoot, work on optimizations, understand the system, push it to new heights, as I'm sure that each of you will be doing shortly here themselves. Um, how many people are, are familiar with MongoDB, uh, have heard of MongoDB? Okay, fair enough. How many people have played with MongoDB, downloaded it? Okay, cool. How many people are using it in production in some fashion? Great, fantastic, great. Um, so good, it's a good mix. Uh, I like having a, a, a broad mix of people out there. So, um, when I, uh, to put this together, oh, by the way too, um, uh, please uh, uh, tweet me if you have any additional um, questions afterwards. I'm going to hand out as many cards as I can possibly, you know, uh, can. I like to keep uh, a lot of contact with everybody because there's always new questions and things like that. I really enjoy meeting out with the, the community and everything, and I want to keep the lines of communication open. So um, feel free, uh, you know, our office is down in Palo Alto, so come by, we'll have lunch, we'll just uh, chew the fat. Um, cool. So talking about MongoDB uh, and Java and our first application in MongoDB. Um, the first thing that I usually, it's easier to describe how to use MongoDB and all the ins and outs of it by doing, um, uh, uh, putting it in the context of an application that you're going to be developing. In this case, I tried to come up with something that would be kind of fun to do. Uh, this would be a surf reporting application. And basically the idea behind this, this kind of uh, demonstration application is that we are going to uh, have a mobile <laughs> application out there that we release to surfers who uh, fictionally, because no surfer will ever tell you that the conditions are good at his beach, he wants you to stay away, um, he's going to have this mobile app and he's going to report the conditions, the wave period, the height <coughs> of the waves, and the uh, surface, surface conditions <coughs> at, his, at his local break. We're going to aggregate this data and then report it back for other users who can check and see what's going on uh, at the beach, if the conditions are good, if it's good to go out there and surf. Um, so basically the, the functionality that we want is allow users to report current conditions. So we're going to be doing um, data upload, quite a bit of uh, uh, concurrent data coming into the system. In addition to that, we're going to allow our user base to get the current conditions at the local spot. So what we want to do is take their geolocation information off of their mobile op, op, app, um, pump it into the database to get back what the current reports are, uh, the most recent reports. And then subsequent to that, we want to add value to the data. We want to get some insight as to what the best conditions are for a beach. Um, uh, beaches and shores, uh, they're like antennas. Um, they are tuned to certain frequencies, and they can be overloaded, um, just like antennas can be. Um, uh, with uh, wave heights that are too good, like you would think the bigger the wave, the better. Sometimes the beach just can't handle uh, a size. So we'll do uh, some basic analysis on the conditions and determine what, what the best conditions are at each. So if this is my hypothetical uh, uh, application, what I, and I'm, I'm, I'm sussing out how I'm going to build the whole thing, right? I'm going to architect the whole solution. One of the things that I'm trying to determine is what my base requirements are of my database, my back-end data store, right? And it kind of boils down to three main things I'm most concerned about. Number one is I need availability, right? Uh, I need the system to be up. It's a web service. Uh, you know, people are going early adopters, might stick with me because they think I'm cool and stuff like that, but the app is going to go nowhere if I'm constantly down. Uh, secondly, um, I need it to perform well. Um, there's going to be a great load on the system, um, and I need the responses to be very fast in order to keep my latency down. Uh, in addition to that, I want to be able to scale up easily because I plan to be a very successful um, service. These are actually the three major design criteria behind MongoDB, is these ideas of availability, scalability, and performance. And in my work and the consultation that I do, it's we're usually addressing means to uh, emphasize each of these three points, right? Notice I'm not talking about my requirement here is not for things like acid transactions, nor is it factoring into my thinking that I want to have schema enforcements and things like that. 
What I need is to get data in and data out reliably and quickly, and lots of it. So that's, that's, the, that's the idea that MongoDB is designed to address. It's the problem space that it's designed to address. Well, first of all, let's see how we get it here. Let's talk about, let's begin at the beginning. Let's talk about the data that we want to store. In order to get performance, availability, and scalability in MongoDB, it all boils down to the understanding the type of data that you wish to store. And in here, um, this is uh, a JSON document. This is a sample document that I'll be storing in MongoDB. Very simple stuff. But um, it, this, this is the description of one report that came in. The user sent in a report. And you can see at the top, there's an object ID, or the underscore ID field. Um, this is the, essentially the primary key uh, for documents within MongoDB. Um, this can be provided to you by the drivers. They're, they're generated automatically for the driver, uh, in the driver layer for you. Um, you can overwrite them, but they need to be unique. So um, uh, on an on a uncharted single instance system, we'll enforce the, the uniqueness for you. But when we get to a sharded system, the um, requirements of it, uh, the, this uniqueness of this key, um, that's what, if you're going to overwrite this, this field, you need to make sure that the, the, uh, the value that you're adding into it is sufficiently unique. So um, it's the primary key. Every, every uh, document in MongoDB has an underscore ID. Um, it's auto-indexed, meaning it's, o it's always indexed. And this is kind of the reason why some people like to overwrite the underscore ID. Um, they want to make use of this index without having to have more indexes or the need to build uh, additional secondary indexes. And it's kind of an interesting little um, data type. It's actually a composite um, number. Uh, it contains the, ma uh, the uh, machine ID, the MAC address the, of, the, of the client, uh, or the system the client application was running, the, the driver was running on. It contains the process ID subsequent to that, and it contains um, a sequence number following that. So the uniqueness is very high with this guy. Um, and it, because it contains this, and this is of course the default value that's assigned from the driver, because it contains these things, there's also some forensic information that's contained in that ID. The collision, um, the likeliness of collision is very small, but it also tells you which, which one of your application servers or which one of your client servers created that. Oh, and it contains the timestamp as well. When this, this document was created, who created it, what process, you can line it up with your logs and get some forensic information. So there's, there's good stuff in there, but you're welcome to overwrite it if you like. Um, the one thing I want to make note of with the, of course, for those that are familiar with uh, MongoDB, we emphasize also that one of the major points is that what we're storing here is a JSON formatted document. Um, in reality, what we're storing is BSON, which is our uh, binary serialization of JSON. So we take this, this document, when it's, when it's passed into the database, it, is, it has been binary serialized. And that allows us on the server side to uh, do things like traverse the document, understand the data types stored within, allows us to implement our secondary indexes on fields embedded within the document. It gives us a lot more options here. We're, we're beyond just a key value store, it's a document store, right? And the neat thing about JSON, what, what makes it great in this, this structure is that you can put, excuse me, you can put um, interesting structures in there. Uh, there's multiple different, uh, multiple types of data types that you can put in the fields. You can have arrays that you see here. In fact, um, you have hierarchical structures, um, which for application developers makes perfect sense. You know, um, objects as we understand them are not flat structures. They have relations, they have um, interior structures, nested structures that we can also show here in, in the JSON document. And that's kind of the reason I designed this particular element this way, right? You, you'll see here that I have a reporter, in this case his name is Tast, that was silly of me, but that, that might be a username indicates who, who the reporter of this, of this uh, surf report was. And then you see the location field is, an actually, is actually a subdocument itself. And inside of that document is an array um, of my locations, uh, my location, my GPS locations, and the name of the, of the beach that I'm at, Fort Point, underneath uh, the Golden Gate Bridge. In addition to that, I have a second 
field at the same level of the location of my um, the conditions that I'm reporting there. And the conditions are pretty lousy. It's a flat day, not, not, not much going on there. But this is, this is actually really cool. Um, the idea behind um, storing this JSON document is that you can put anything in it that, that makes sense to your application. In fact, for schema design within MongoDB, that's the, the rule of thumb, is you store data the way that your application layer wants to see it or can use it, right? <coughs> complex data structures in here, as complex as you want them to be. And there's no schema enforcement. MongoDB doesn't care um, if some of the fields are present in some of the documents and, uh, or if, if they're not. Um, in fact, there's no enforcement on the, the data types that you can have on each of the fields. It's like a dynamically typed system if you squint hard enough. So the, the idea with this is that it gives you a great deal of flexibility. Um, of course, now, documents within a collection, um, in MongoDB, uh, uh, we have a structure, or data model has what's called collections within databases. This is very close to tables within uh, our DBMSs. So um, by virtue of normal, good programming practices, documents within the same collection will generally have the same structure, right? because that makes sense for you guys on the application, right? Um, we're not enforcing any kind of structure, but generally they will be of a same type. They will, they will be the same shape. Um, but you get the added flexibility of being able to change your data structure um, to suit you. Uh, you might be prototyping, and you don't have to do a data model analysis. You don't have to change the enforcement of the data model. You have flexibility here to make it work the way you need it to work. Okay. So subsequent to this, we have, um, uh, I'm thinking about my access patterns, about how I want to get to this data when, when I'm using it, right? So um, what I'm defining here are the, the indexes that are actually going to be built uh, off of this data, right? So I'm declaring that I want a geospa geospatial index I want, because I'm location-based. I want to be able to look up data that's close to me. Um, uh, if I happen to be near Fort Point, I want to issue a, a query that tells me the conditions of local beaches around me within, let's say, 10 miles or so. So I'm going to build a, a special case of a, what we call a multi-key index. In, in MongoDB, your secondary indexes can be multi-key indexes, which means that you build an index on the elements of an array. In this case, we're going to create a special instance of the multi-key index um, being the, geo the geospatial index that we have. Right? In addition to that, I'm going, I can also create compound indexes on two fields within a document. And in this case, uh, one of my search patterns are going to be, I'm going to search by um, uh, beaches, that my favorite beaches, one of which would be Fort Point. And um, the second element within this compound index, secondary index, is going to be the date. Because I'm not really interested in what the conditions were three years ago. I want to know what they, what they are right now, currently, within the last 24 hours. How are they trending? Things like that. So um, a, big, a big part of what we call um, schema design in MongoDB is choosing the right indexes that work well for you, um, that can expedite those reads. Uh, of course, you, choosing the right ones are important because um, they'll, they'll allow you get, to get to the data very quickly. Um, the, the, the naive kind of uh, uh, flip to that would be, well, great, I, if I can do secondary indexes, I'll index on every field in the, in the document. Who can tell me what, what basically the problem with that is? More indexes than data. Uh, well, that's not necessarily a problem. That can be. That's okay. But that's along. That's along the, the that, That's the right way to go. When you do insert, it costs you. Yes, when when you do inserts, it costs you, because the, um, when you insert the data or you alter the data, the index B trees are going to be rebuilt. What's actually really nice about MongoDB is yes, we have the secondary indexes. We have a number of different types of indexes that will work for you: sparse indexes, unique indexes, what have you. Um, but we don't want to forget that there's always a cost associated with indexing within any kind of, of database. And MongoDB keeps its indexes uh, consistent on every write or update that occurs on the document. So if I change some field within this document, or I inserted a new document, my index needs to be rebuilt at that time. If you have many, many, many indexes, that's going to incur costs. So 
part of the design you have to think about is, is understanding your access patterns, how you want to access the data, and then using that kind of smart design for um, saying how, index, how many indexes work for you, um, if, they're, if they're right. I'm trying to speed up here. Okay, so let's talk about how we, now we've, we've talked about a data structure, how are we gonna, um, how are we gonna get to it from Java, from the client level? Well, we would use the Java driver, of course. And the Java driver is one among, I think, 13 or 14 officially supported drivers that we have in, uh, in TenGen that we support. Uh, we want to make it easy for every application programmer to get in uh, and use MongoDB, so we can support a great deal of drivers. The main responsibilities of the driver is primarily to manage the connection to the database, uh, of course, but it's also uh, responsible for translating objects in your native language. In, your, uh, in the case of, of Java, it's going to be beans or it's going to be Java objects, Kojos, translating them, serializing them to be transmitted over our wire protocol back into um, the database via these BSON objects, these binary serialized uh, <coughs> JSON objects. Additionally, we'll manage cursors because you can issue a query and then get back a large result set and you're going to have to maintain a, a cursor back to the, to the server. So there's some state there that we need to maintain in the driver. And also uh, replica set awareness. And I'll go into what replica sets are shortly, but basically um, MongoDB is a cluster of servers. And the driver takes care of what the state of the cluster is, who's up, who's down, who's primary, who's secondary, who's replicating for whom. Um, and uh, the driver all handles that for you. Um, and we'll sh I'll show you how that works in a bit. Um, so let's talk about just briefly what the wire protocol is. Again, it's a TCA, uh, TCP IP socket based connection back to the server, right? The wire protocol um, is a, all the data exchange is through VSON. In fact, you can think of everything that you're interacting with MongoDB is basically through JSON objects, right? There's some headers associated with the protocol and all that kind of stuff, but almost everything is coming. Uh, the way that you'll see it is through JSON, um, translated in VSON over the wire protocol and back. Um, it's the primary representation of data within MongoDB. And uh, yeah, the idea, the reason that we do that is that we can traverse this document. We know how to locate fields within the document. Um, and then the nuts and bolts, of, before we dive into uh, uh, a whole bunch of the code here, is the connection management within the Java driver. For version 2.10 of the Java driver, we're going to something called uh, Mongo Client. In earlier versions, we just called it Mongo, which, which was the object that represented a connection to a cluster, uh, a single cluster of, of MongoDB instances. Um, it could be a single node, um, or it could be a massively sharded system. Um, but you would understand Mongo represented this connection from the driver to that database instance, right? Um, and it, the connection was uh, managed through uh, the DB port pool object, um, which has, uh, in version 2.9 and earlier, had a default of um, 10 connections, 10 concurrent connections, with a multiplier of 5. Uh, for the, uh, the multiplier was the, the number of threads that can wait or block in order to get that connection. So the way that the DB port pool works is that um, it will uh, lazily allocate sockets onto your, onto your database, right? And then once having to allocate them, we want to avoid socket churn. So we hang on to them. And for as long as the Mongo or Mongo client instance is, is still being used, can be referenced by your, uh, it isn't garbage collected. Um, so we're going to keep those sockets open so we don't have to keep establishing the socket, drop the socket, establish the socket. This is especially uh, prudent because there, there's also authentication that can occur over the socket. And we don't want to have to re-authenticate on every request. So basically, we'll have a port, uh, a set of sockets, um, and then additionally, we'll have a multiplier that allows a number of threads to wait uh, so you can tune your concurrency levels in the driver. Um, and it's all managed by a, a semaphore, so should you exceed the, 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 the size of the semaphore, you'll get a semaphore's out exception. You just catch it and, and handle it the way that you need to handle it in your application. And then to to handle all sorts of different kinds of ways that you want to interact with your database is the, finally the Mongo client options, which you pass the Mongo client uh, object 
to say, do I want to be consistent, um, uh, strongly consistent, eventually consistent? Do I want to uh, write to a specific shard set or you know any number of different things? Uh, error states that I can I can use. <coughs> so let's actually um, let's take a look. Let me drop out of this. And just take a quick look at some of the examples that I've got here. So I, I cooked up some, some objects here. Um, and I've got some examples commented out that we'll, we'll perform here. But uh, basically, the idea here is, is that I'm, I'm going to store and retrieve some report information. And the first thing that I'm doing here is I've created a, a basic DAO that I'm, I'm working with. And the, what I want to show here first is how I initialize, if you can still hear me, um, how I initialize the system. So I've got some, some basic static variables for searching on geolocations. That's not too interesting right here. But you'll see in my constructor, down here, where do I put report down? Oh, whoops. So up here, um, I'm going to uh, uh, connect against a replica set, um, uh, which is running on my, my laptop here. A replica set is a um, small cluster of, of uh, databases or servers that are replicating from one another. Should one fail, another, you have this, this availability guarantee of redundant servers, right, that, that share the same data. So right now, initially, you can see here that I am um, creating a, a list of servers that I want to connect to. I'm declaring um, a seed list of servers that uh, represent some of the servers in my replica set. I could, in this case, I'm just doing three, right? I could actually give two, and Mongo client would say, okay, I understand this to be a seed list. Um, I know at least that there's two servers that I'm to connect to. So I'm going to I auto discover the rest of the replica set. I could have a replica set size of five, seven, 13, what have you. Um, and Mongo client will figure that out for me. Um, or I can just explicitly say all of them right up here as I have right there. Um, so uh, at, subsequent to that, I'm going to start creating a, um, my, my client connections here, my options. Um, and you can see here, this is the concurrency levels that I'm seeing here. This is kind of arbitrary. I said five connections per host. It doesn't have to be that great with a multiplier of 10. So I can have up to 55 threads um, being handled by the, the, the client. Yeah. Can you make it bigger? Oh, yeah, certainly. Apologize for that. All right. Better? Yes. Okay. So here was our server list. Thank you for bearing with me on that one. So here's our server list. Um, that's the set of that's the seed list that we're going to connect to. Very basic stuff. I mean, no one no one would in a in a in a production environment would actually deploy three three nodes to the same box. But for the sake of the de demonstration, that's what I'm going to do here. Um, and then you see d just below that, I'm, I'm, I'm instantiating a builder from which I will create my client options, and I have, I'm setting my concurrency. Um, uh, uh, I'm setting my concurrency levels here for the, the client at this point. You'll see more stuff: durability and consistency. We're going to get into that in one second, but that's just basically how we start off, right? So before we return to that, let's go back to. <coughs> Let's talk about availability. Now, um, remember the three columns, the three performance columns was availability, scalability, and performance, okay? Um, so let's talk about availability. So what is a replica set? Okay, so replica set is a cluster of, in MongoDB, right? The idea is, is that we're going to create three nodes, in this case, a very simple one, right? And I introduce these nodes to one another in their independent configurations, and I tell them that they're members of a set, and here are their siblings. Once they're up, they will initialize and um, introduce themselves to one another and establish heartbeat communications for help between the nodes. Uh, I think the interval is once every 10 seconds that they'll contact one another say, are you okay? Yes, I'm okay. Do we agree on who the primary is? Um, at this point, when they first initialize themselves, they will not agree on the primary because there is no primary, right? So at this point, they'll say like, okay, we are a replica set of three guys Right? We've got to elect the primary, right? And the, the rule is, is that for a primary to be um, elected from the set, 
a majority of the servers, the primary must be elected from a majority of the servers of the original set being in content, right? At this point, and I'll explain what that means in a second, but at this point we elect node three to be the primary. That means that all the writes are going to go to node three. He's our primary, right? We're a single master system in MongoDB. There's a reason that we do that, right? We're a single master system. Um, the redundancy levels that we establish now are, are we have a redundancy of uh, three, right? We have the node two and node one will now follow on an operation by operation basis the writes and updates that occur on node three. There's a circular buffer inside of each of these guys called a oplog, right? Circular buffer so it doesn't override its space and you can continue to write to it and all that kind of stuff. Each of the secondaries, the tailing secondaries, maintain a cursor that follows on as fast as it can to every operation um, that's recorded in the op log that occurs on the primary. And, and they're recorded as item potent operations, right? So um, an operation might be uh, increment x uh, by one, right? The item potent form of that would be set x equal five, right? And the reason that we want an item potent form on the primary in the top log is that you can you're always consistent no matter where you are tailing the op log, right, from the secondaries. You'll never be in an inconsistent data state um, while you're replicating, okay? So now, what happens if we, ha if we lose this primary? Suddenly somebody trips on a switch, um, somebody runs a backhoe over the power connection to our data center, or there's just a, ne uh, there's a network um, partition, which is far, happens far too frequently, right? We lose communication to primary within the replicate, replica set. It can't contact the, the other two nodes. They detect this. They, through the heartbeat <coughs> information, they stop. They detect this, and they say, okay, node, node three is down. We don't have it. We need to have another election and get going again, because we've got to have a primary. They say, look, yes, uh, we have a majority. The remaining nodes uh, are a majority of the original set, right? Two out of three is a majority. So. We'll elect a new primary, and node two will start picking up the writes. During that time, you, do, you don't have write operability. You, have, you can have read operability, but you won't be able to write because there is no primary or a single master system. The elections usually take about two seconds. They're about one to two seconds. Um, and then the, the new primary is elected. He's up, and you get writes again. The Java driver will detect this change without you having to intervene. This is an important point. So, this is part of the high availability that we, we've designed in the MongoDB, is that if the primary comes down, uh, until the new primary is elected, you won't be able to write. Um, but when the new primary, the election is complete, the driver is updated in its state, and it will let you continue on with your operations. No intervention is necessary. Certainly, you want to log your, this, this event. You want to find out what happened, right? You want to go back and see why the, the, this, this node became unavailable. But, it avoids you having to figure out all sorts of weird server uh, log scrapes and all that kind of stuff in the middle of the night, right? So subsequent to that, let's say node three comes back. He is um, he used to be the primary, but now when he comes back into the system, he's going to come back as a secondary, right? Um, and he's going to follow on the primary. The, the reason, of course, is that this primary and the node two has been up for some time. He's taken writes. He's further <laughs> along. He has the most recent data. So secondary. To, uh, Three, uh, node three will come back as a secondary. It doesn't have special status unless you assign it to him. That's one of the configuration parameters you can have. Okay, so with that in mind, let's talk about some durability, right? Well, actually, let's take a look at um, the uh, yeah. Let's talk about durability when we write or insert to the database. So. Um, because this is the this is the uh, the availability system that we have, we have about five different levels of durability that you can use for write inserts. The big news with MongoDB uh, and uh, version 2.10 uh, of the driver, uh, the Java driver, is that prior versions we used to do what was called fire and forget, meaning as long as the, the socket's open, our default write concern would be to send off our our write request and move on to other things, right? The idea was is that at the time when MongoDB was first evolving, the idea was that the client <coughs> level would have extreme speed, right? It wasn't going to wait for, uh, 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 it wasn't going to check for errors on insertions. We, we have that durability guarantee. It was just 
not what the default deployment was going to be in the driver. Since that, since for version 2.10 we've changed it, where the default now is check for error. If the database says, hey, I have a problem with this insertion, you know, you need to know that uh, this didn't work or this update, this write didn't work. I'm telling you now, you, you want to read, you want to retry, or you want to handle it some other way. That's the new default for the Mongo client, right? In addition to that, we have other uh, higher levels of durability, which is the journal, writing to journal, uh, flushing disk, and replication. So in a nutshell, part of the reason it makes MongoDB so fast is that all the operations occur in memory, right? We're memory mapped. So, um, uh, and then subsequent to these changes having occurred in memory, they're, they're occurring in dirty, they dirty the pages. And the operating system will say like, okay, it's time to flush the dirty pages out to disk and get back up. That should, that will not take more than 60 seconds between a write that occurred onto MongoDB and the hard cutoff of flushing to disk will never be more than 60 seconds. Typically, that's much, much smaller, right? But if we're talking about a high availability system and a node fails, what's the danger with in-memory writes that haven't been backed up to disk? We'll have lost them, right? And we're talking about a high performance system, right? Where you can have several thousand writes per second, maybe tens of thousands of writes per second. It would be pretty detrimental to just lose that on a failure. So what we use, and this is on by default in version 2.0 and up, is the journal, the write-ahead journal. And what it is, it's an appended file, right? So it's much faster than normal writes to disk because writes to disk on the documents themselves have a random access pattern, random seek, right? But we write to a journal file, write-ahead journal. Every time that you, you write uh, into memory, it, the operation is backed up into the journal, right? Should the note come down, Right? On recovery, it will replay the journal to get you back into a consistent state. So you wouldn't have lost those writes. Now, there's a, um, the journal flush occurs at the most every 100 milliseconds. Right? So you might, you might lose data within that 100 milliseconds. You can lower, you can change the configuration to make that interval smaller. But um, once you get it into journal, you're good. You're durable on that server. Okay, so one of the right conditions you can say is, okay, instead of just sending the write off to the database, I'm gonna wait for confirmation that it's gonna be on the journal, right? Prior to having the write ahead journal on, we had flush to disk, which means I wanna confirm that the operating system has flushed the dirty page to, to the disk. That is going to take sometimes much longer, and so you, you're gonna be hanging on to a thread in the client a little bit longer than you normally would for the journal. With the journal concern, it pretty much obsolesces flush to disk. If you're in the journal, you're good. You don't have to wait for flush to flush to disk. We leave it there for uh, backwards compatibility. And then, of course, there, we have another level of durability, which is replication. Um, and that's kind of an example that I have in my code, is that you can say, I want, I want this write to have been replicated to one other node, to a secondary, or a majority of secondaries, right? Or all of my uh, secondaries. You can set different levels within there. The caveat is, is that if, you're if you have higher durability levels that you need to enforce, um, you're, you're going to need to wait for that operation to come back uh, confirmed OK. In the case of replication, if you're replicating, you're going to have a lag, at least that you're going to have to wait for the replication lag to occur. Um, that's fine. Um, there's, there's not necessarily any problems with that. Some pieces of data, you'll want to use high levels of uh, write guarantees, write concerns, other pieces of data, you're, you might be okay um, not checking every single time. Doesn't mean your data is disappear disappearing, it just means that you're not checking to see confirmation that the operation went okay. In the case of, um, in the, case of the uh, reporting application, I may not want to wait for replication on, it, on all of my incoming reports. Why? If I lose a report, it's okay. Um, I, I, you know, like another person may come along and uh, enter a report for the same beach eventually. Users coming into the system, making payments on, on products, things like that, or registering themselves into the service, I'd want to have a higher durability guarantee because I want to make sure I don't lose those people. So let's take a look. So, um, In our first example, um, we're going to do an insertion here, right? 
And I'm just, this is generate report, this is random generation for something, I guess, two days ago, I'll say, and I'm going to insert this report. In the DAO, you'll see, well, actually, let me go back to the concerns that I set here. In my options, I'm setting my right concern to majority, right? Majority means that I, I want it to go to two, if I have a replica set of three nodes, I want it to be replicated to two, right? Now, some people put in hard-coded numbers, right? They know that they happen to be a replica set of three uh, or, or five, and they'll put in numbers, uh, two, three, what have you. Um, I, I don't recommend that, because uh, you, if, let's say, two nodes come down, uh, uh, out, of, out of your set of five, hard numbers, you need more dynamic value there. Your, your, your node may have changed, then you've got to go up and update your code. Um, using majority is a great way to, to do this um, automatically um, for, for uh, replication that you want. Essentially, you're establishing a quorum on the insert. So this guy is pretty simple. We'll just write this. And we get our output here. This is... Um, this is not actually the document that I wrote. This is the re this is the result of the write. It tells me who the who the server was, the operation time, connection ID, who it replicated to, um, no errors. <coughs> and there should be if I can get over there. There's going to be one more OK, which you can't see. OK equals um, one. There we go. It indicates that this operation executed as I wanted it to be. Very simple. Um, let's take another look here. Let's pull something out. Okay. Bonk. So uh, here in this case, I'm doing a quick read um, for everything reports near this location within nine tenths of a of a of a degree um, in geospatial coordinates. And you see that this is my, my result. Yeah. These are the, I apologize for how difficult this is, but you can read that this is a string representation of the, of the object that I got back um, from the database. And you'll see that people are reporting wave heights, the period in seconds, the, um, what the quality of the, of the conditions were, whatnot, and the date that these occurred. So that's a simple read. Now, um, interestingly enough, let's talk about reads. For, um, let's talk about consistency. Um, how many people are familiar with distributed databases with no SQL solutions? Anybody played with Cassandra a bit? Played with maybe Couch, uh, CouchDB? Okay. So there's consistency levels in a distributed database, especially in replication. So within MongoDB, we're out of box what we call strongly consistent. Um, meaning that the drivers are configured by default to do all their reads and all their writes from the primary. In this kind of a configuration, the secondaries are there only for backup, for, uh, backup and redundancy, right? You can use the secondaries for other things, taking snapshots of the system, doing backups, things like that. But right now, what's important about what we're doing on our reads is that any of the writes that occurred prior to this read operation will see the changes on that document. So let's say somebody inserts a report and then immediately reads it back. He will, he's in a strongly consistent system. Now we enforce uh, consistency or at our level of uh, atomic operations are going to be at the document level, right? We don't do acid transactions in the sense that you can join two documents and you're not, you're, you could see the, the documents, two separate documents in an inconsistent state relative to one another, right? But as long as you're reading or writing to a single document, you're always going to see that document in a, in, a, in a consistent state. That's kind of the reason to use more complex uh, object types like J uh, JSON. Because the more you pack into that object, the more you know, uh, the net less you need to have these joins from multiple different tables, right? The less that you have joins, the higher um, the, the less overhead associated with having joins and locks, right? So you get performance that way. If you can get rid of the reason for having these joins by having complex data types stored in your, in your document store, the better, right? However, it could be the case that you want to scale out your reads, right? 
I've got these secondaries, which are within one or two seconds in replication line with the primary. It seems to me that I can get some scale on my reads by using what we call um, eventual consistency. Where in this case, I've enabled the driver to do uh, read operations off the secondary. Right? And then you can see an example of that in my code over here in the surf report. When I uh, initialize my Mongo client, I'm making it on time, getting close on time. Um, my operations, I set it for my read preference is secondary preferred, right? Okay, so that, what that means is by going into an inconsistent state, the data that I'm operating on, it's okay if I don't see the absolute most up-to-date documents on my reports. I can still infer what the, what the conditions are at the beach based on the, the, uh, uh, the average of the, uh, the reports that I'm seeing. Plus, if the primary is down for whatever reason, I don't lose total operability on my database because I can go out and I can read off of the secondaries. In fact, if I do this third, let's see, let's do failure, right? Okay, so I'm just gonna go into a true loop and I'm gonna keep reading from this, from this operation. So let's go ahead and play that, see how it goes. Every two seconds, it's gonna read from this guy First, first report that's in the heated. Now, I'm going to um, step down this guy. Or let's, uh, let's, uh, let's say for five seconds. Cool. So I brought down my primary intentionally. So you saw that there was a little bit of an error there, but I'm still getting my reads, right? So what happened is the driver said, whoa, the primary just went out of way. And I can't see that node anymore, what happened, right? I'm going to re report back that exception. But since I'm, I'm configured to read from the secondaries, I'm still operable, right? Now, in five seconds, if it hasn't occurred already, the, the primary is going to come back. The, um, the, the, <coughs> the driver will make note of that, update its state, and says, hey, I've got the primary back. I'm good to go. So that's the advantage of using secondary preferred. Um, so as you can see, we define what's called read preferences. And these are the different levels. These are the, the ways that you can configure. Out of box is primary, right? I will only do my reads from the primary, so I'm strongly consistent. And the sub subsequent to that, I could try primary preferred, which means as long as there's a primary, I'm happy to go to that guy. But if he's not available for whatever reason, I'll go to a secondary. It's not the end of the world. There's other configurations where you'd say, like, I don't want to task any of my primary with anything but doing writes and inserts. I want to separate the workload. So I'm going to send my queries only to the secondaries, right? Secondaries alone, never the primary. Or you can do something similar to that, which is secondary preferred. But if the secondary isn't close by, isn't, isn't available, I'll go to the primary. And then the last one is nearest. The Java driver will do pings. To the, to the replica node members, right? He'll ping each of these guys to determine who has the lowest network latency, right? Um, and then says, I, I will send from that, the, the, the set, that, the replica set that comes back the fastest, anybody who's within 15 milliseconds in response time to the first guy on ping time is my set, within my set of nearest nodes. And those guys are candidates for um, getting requests on nearest, right? We don't want to just hit the nearest one, the nearest node, because we could slam it, call it, cause it to shutter, and then the next one would come up as the, the highest, uh, the fastest responding, and then everybody would stampede to that guy and slam him. So there's a set of nearest op, uh, nearest nodes that we will operate on. That's our read preferences. Okay, so let's actually do a query. What does a query look like? If I were actually doing it within the shell, uh, the shell is basically our command line application for MongoDB. Um, if I were going to do it from the shell, this is actually what the command would be. You see db.reports, where reports is the, my table name or my collection name, and the operation that I'm going to perform is fine. Everything in MongoDB is JSON, right? Including the query language. So if you see here, I'm building a query where I'm saying, um, get local reports, right? Um, uh, remember that coordinates was a, uh, a sub-document inside of location, so I'm using the dot notation to locate that data element. <coughs> So location.coordinates find near my current location with a max distance of uh, 9 tenths of a of degree. Right? Um, I want today's report, I didn't get highlighted. 
you'll see that date is greater than or equal to this date, uh, 2012, uh, August 9th. Um, so I'm getting today's reports. I don't want to go back too far. Anything greater than that timestamp, that's what I want, right? And um, return only to the relevant information. I see I put in a typo in there. But um, all I want is location, name, and conditions, right? I, I can return a subset of my, of my document. I don't need the full field if I don't want to, right? And then, of course, sort by the ratings. Uh, um, negative one means uh, uh, descending order. Uh, positive one would mean ascending order on the, on the, on the uh, sort order. This makes sense because I only want to see five star conditions first. I don't really care about the crap ones, right? So let's take a look at what that looks like inside of the, um, the analyzer. So number one, um, just as you, just show you this, the data object I'm working with here, basic POJO. Nothing, nothing really amazing about this. I just made it as an immutable object, right? Um, and then I have my getters here, you know, it's mutable, so I'm only passing in um, the, 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 uh, uh, the data within the instructor. What's really going on is in the data here, right? And here I have to DB object um, um, uh, unmarshalling. This is how I convert it from the, the BSON object that I got back from the, from the, um, from the driver. I'm going to unmarshal it into the, the report object that I can work with um, within my application, right? So basically, um, I have, I'm, I'm, I'm creating a set of methods within my DAP, right? Um, based on the query patterns that I want to enforce, right? Or enable. In this case, I'm saying get reports near longitude, latitude, and radius, right? Why would I do this, right? Instead of just create a query myself. I want to enforce that any queries that come in off the production data uses an index. So I'm using the DAO to enforce that <coughs> any query uses an index. Otherwise, somebody might inadvertently cause a full table scale, and my performance in my database goes down, right? So in this case, also, I, I have another way of accessing it, it reports by name. I allow this because I know that I'm indexed on name, so I'm restricting from my application layer how the access is going to occur to the database for performance reasons. So, um, yeah, so we've already seen an example with the retrieval on that deck. Um, additionally to the, um, uh, just one more note about uh, reads, we can use tags on our notes, okay? Tags are little flags. Um, the idea with this is that you can assign workloads by tagging certain notes. So, uh, or I might want to have, um, let's say, I can use this for my writes as well. You'll see here that um, this is kind of showing an EC2 instance. The idea being is that um, uh, I have a couple of tags. I'm saying which data centers these, these nodes are in, but also which region that they're in, such that if there's an outage on a region level, I can, I can do an error report on my right concern. I can say that uh, I'll create a custom report where I want replication to have occurred to two regions, that my durability is that high. If a region comes down, then that those writes are going to start failing and throwing exceptions. I catch the exceptions and deal with them on the application. Okay, well, I'm gonna speed through the last few stuff about this. Um, uh, some other fun stuff, what I was talking about analysis that we can do within the system. Um, one of the new features for version 2.2 of MongoDB is the aggregation framework. So there's actually three kinds of tools of analysis that we have in MongoDB, right? MongoDB up to this point is a great place to store data and get it back fast and big data and scale data, right? But we also want to add value or an insight into the data that we're doing. So what we have is a native uh, implementation of MapReduce that executes in the JavaScript interpreter on the servers, or native implementation of, of MapReduce. It's a, it's a good tool for analysis. It beats having to put up a Hadoop cluster if you want to get just an initial insight into your data. You just want to take a peek and see what, what the data is trying to tell you. Um, but it's uh, up until version 2.4, it's single threaded. So there's only so much data crunching that you can do um, uh, uh, so fast. It's kind of a, it's a limited tool. So we came up with the aggregation framework and uh, it uses the same query syntax as um, uh, the uh, queries that we do in MongoDB. The idea is even though it's declared in JSON, it's executed in C++, so it's multi-threaded. It's, um, and therefore your concurrency levels can be much higher with it. Um, its performance is much better because it doesn't have to be interpreted in JavaScript and then translated back into the BSON types. 
Um, and, but the idea is, is that it's, it's a kind of a simpler, more specified tool for aggregations, sums, counts, things of that nature. Um, the idea behind the aggregation framework is that it be high performance and easy to understand, easy to use. So the pattern that we followed with, with doing queries on the aggregation framework is the pipeline <coughs> pattern. Now, how many people know command line pipes in Linux, Unix? Yeah, same idea. Dirt simple, right? The uh, output of one, of one pipeline operation is the input to the next subsequent pipeline operation. We like that idea. I thought it was cool. So the same idea goes here. So for my analysis here, I'm trying to average the conditions that are occurring at a beach. In this case, I'm interested in Lindemar specifically. So these are my pipeline operations. And you see I'm going to match on Lindemar. I'm going to project a subset of the fields. I don't need the full, uh, uh, I don't need the full record, um, only a subs subset of it to keep my memory allocation usage low. And then I'm going to group by ratings. What conditions correlate to best ratings? And then I'm going to sort by the best conditions, so I'll find out what the average wave heights, periods, and uh, were for, for Lindemar, uh, grouped by um, uh, rating. So here's how it would look uh, in JSON, right? Uh, match Lindemar, you can see here that I'm, I'm declaring an aggregate function on my reports collection, right? And subsequent to that is this uh, pipeline field, which is an array of sub-documents. The first doc uh, each document is a pipeline operation. First one is match. Second one is pr project only the conditions sub-object or sub-document into the next operation, which is to group by the conditions rating, and then use the um, convenience operators of average, right, to average those conditions, and then finally sort by the condition in this in a descending order, best conditions first. Um, so basically, for that one, that's pretty simple as well. Just go down here, comment that out. So there's two things that are going to come out here. This is the, this is the result. Uh, the first line here is telling me the results of my operation. Oops, I guess I had something before. This line right here. Um, it's, it's telling me the, uh, the command that I issued, this aggregation command, and what the results of it. Were there any errors? Who was it sent to? All that kind of stuff. The second portion is the, actually the output of this, of this aggregation um, command. You'll see that. Here's, here's for um, ID4, uh, which correlates to four-star conditions. The average height is just over five feet. The period was just about 16 seconds or thereabouts. Um, condition three stars, you know, you see the conditions deteriorate in the average height, all that kind of stuff. The, the idea with this example is that it's, there's actually a lot more um, interesting analysis that you can do on signal processing. But for the sake of this uh, uh, demonstration, it's all about simplicity. So that's basically it. Um, right now, with the aggregation framework, it's going to, the output of the of the um, analysis is going to be within one document. Right? Coming out for two four, we're targeting um, is that you'll be able to pump the results back into a collection, uh, so that you're not limited in your result set. Uh, our document um, limits on MongoDB are 16 megabytes, so the results would have to be within that 16 megabyte chunk. Right? For a larger analysis or a greater amount of data, it's going to make more sense to put that back in the database and then issue queries on that, that analysis result. Okay, so one last part I want to get to. I, I know I'm cutting close on time and patience, but the um, last thing I want to talk about is scaling language. Remember, we talked about three design criteria. Um, there is the uh, uh, availability, the performance, and now we're going to talk about scaling. It's very important, right? So how many people have heard about sharding in, in one fashion or another? Right. So uh, the idea with MongoDB is very simple. Rather than getting a bigger box with bigger disk, with bigger CPU, with more IOPS, um, more expensive, and it's still a single, single point of failure, MongoDB is designed to use commodity hardware and scale up horizontally. And you can do it incrementally, meaning that you just add it into your cluster as is necessary for your data set growth. So it's this horizontal pattern. If once we get to a degree of success in our company, that we want to, our, our data set is getting larger, the needs, we need to have more parallelism in our, in our database for current connections, current operations, that we'll just scale up horizontally. We'll get more servers, lower cost servers. 
And now we're going to a four sharded system here. The idea with this is that the client application will be sending queries that are distributed across the shards. MongoDB distributes load by distributing data, right? So um, we can get a higher amount of concurrent operations because we're only targeting uh, queries to the servers that contain the data. And I'll show you what that means. The idea was is that before we were sharded, we were a single instance, and we had one monolithic block of data. When I want to go to a sharded system, I declare a partition key or a shard key. In MongoDB, that's a range index, right? So I'll take one of the fields of my document and say, divide up the, the uh, data set based on this field, right? Now, I could use a hashing algorithm, but there's greater optimization that can happen with range indexing. If I, hashing is very good for distributing data, but it's not very good because it doesn't have any logical locality associated with the data, right? If my query patterns are, if I'm looking up by beach, which I have, right? People say, like, show me what the conditions are at this beach. If that's my predominant query pattern, that's most likely going to be an excellent um, shard key uh, uh, because if I divide, uh, I, I'm distributing load by distributing data. If I distribute the data based on the way that I access it in my query pattern, I'm getting the best optimization I can out of my data. I'll show you how, what happens here. So now having, having defined this range of the data, right, and you can see it's here, it's on beach name, MongoDB automatically says, well, okay, so this data set is too big. It's, it's one monolithic chunk. I need to split it up. So I'm going to start splitting it and define those splits on the range, the, the partition key, the shard key and continue to split it up until I can get it down to manageable chunks. These chunks are going to be about 32 to 64 megabytes in size. Why? Because if they were too small, we would be doing a lot of passing of data back and forth. It wouldn't be very efficient to server to server. We're looking for a sweet spot that we don't want to saturate the network and we don't want to increase the number of I operations, IO operations on our disk, right? So there's a sweet spot, right? And the chunk size is an important part of that optimization. Once I've divided it up into these manageable chunks, I then distribute my chunks across the shards. At this point, as data grows, right, if I've gotten a good shard key, the data growth is going to be organic. It's going to grow. Um, uh, each of the data sets are going to part, grow and be split themselves, and hopefully you'll have a pretty good balance. But in this case, which shard is probably getting the most traffic? Can you see? Shard three, right? Uh, try as I might to have a great shard key, I might have, I, I might see a peak. Um, let's say Mavericks. Uh, everybody knows about Mavericks, 40 foot waves, amazing dinosaur killer waves just off of the, uh, uh, off of a Pat Moon Day. In the winter, people go crazy about the place. There's a, like a festival, it's like Mardi Gras out there. So let's say it's December and it's the Mavericks International Surf Contest and everybody's checking conditions or making reports. That happens that that particular logical chunk lives on shard three, so there's this burst of data, right? And my shards are out of, are imbalanced, they're, they're not balanced. So the load balancer, automatically part of MongoDB, will redistribute chunks to get rid of that hot spot, right? Okay, so, um, and you don't have to intervene on this part. This happens all automatically. The upshot of this whole thing is that when you are actually talking to a sharded environment, it's no different than you were talking to a single system. We have a, a, a router um, uh, instance or a process that we call Mongo S that you, you talk to. You talk to through the, um, the, uh, the driver. You give the host name of the Mongo S and it handles the routing for all your queries automatically. A lot of people assume that they have to actually assign uh, shard ranges to each, uh, or chunks, chunk ranges to each shard. That's something that you don't need to worry about. That's not an application level <coughs> management uh, problem, task. That's not a concern of the client of the database. All you want to know is that you're asking this database. You don't even really care how big your database is or how many shards are out there or what the chunk splits are. We take care of that for you. So the interesting part of this is that as you grow from an initial startup or, or whatever you're doing, the, the first time that you're, you're, you're programming this, this application, you may be talking to a single node, but as you go from a single node to a replica set, to a sharded system, to a massively sharded system, it's, there's no required changes on your client level. You don't care. You just change the host name resolution. 
uh, on the, um, in the climate, right? And you always see it as a single massive database, right? A high performance database. Is there a question? Or, no, just um, so some last stuff, some last tips. Basically, when you when you start using MongoDB within Java, some important things <coughs> uh, crop up. You might have detected that since there's no schema um, enforcement on the server, where do you suppose schema enforcement is going to occur? On, on the client, right? And who writes the client code? You do, right? So that gives you a lot of freedom and flexibility. But it, it now it's putting more responsibility on the client level. Um, Traditionalists may have uh, sometimes have a little bit of uh, have exception with that. I personally don't. The re um, as an application guy, good application programming translates into good MongoDB programming. So there's nothing to worry about as far as I'm concerned. It's like you, the idea of being here with these tips is that like uh, you want to avoid full table scans. We have commands within MongoDB that uh, uh, you can say no table scan, which means that no query can execute on, on the database that doesn't use an index. But on the same token, you would just write your application layer that it uses predefined queries, right? This is also good practice because you can well, run these queries as part of your integration tests for pre-releases, right? Um, instrument your code. You want to understand how things are performing, right? Don't wait. Um, it could be as far as log scraping or actually taking metrics off of the code itself. But you want to get an idea of how your system performs over time. So, you don't want to wait for error conditions. Um, and, and by that same token, maintain some query execution history so you understand the way that your system is operating and you can tune it. Um, and also put in some ODM level monitoring. Oh, for those that are not familiar with this idea of ODMs, so um, there are ORMs for MongoDB that, to be syntactically correct, we say object data mappers rather than relational mappers because it's not a relational database. And there's some advantages for using ODMs. Um, uh, the idea being, of course, is that that's another way of enforcing a kind of schema or document structure on the system. Um, yeah, so those are the kind of tips as you go into your deployment. Uh, I tried to pack in a lot of uh, information in this um, uh, out of respect to you guys. I apologize if it was too dense, but <laughs> not fast enough. Uh, but I'm available for questions um, and, uh, of course, I'll, um, available at, at TenGen as well. Uh, I'll give you my card and my Twitter is blipdot. Um, so I'll take questions and thank you. You have three notes and one master, two seconds to release so the other master uh, right now. Uh, this one to the second to become the master. Um, and then later, the, uh, the original master and come back up, become the second to uh, How does that uh, get us sync? Okay, so this is an excellent question. The question was um, uh, if my primary goes down and there's a replication lag, right? So let's go back up to this failure scenario. My primary comes down, I've been writing to it happily. The new primary comes up, and the secondary the, the node three recovers. What happened to my writes? And I've been journaling, right? So when it came back up, it, it reran the journal. What happened to that data within that one second of replication? What, what happened to it? Um, the question, the, the answer to that is a very good question. Is that we create what's called a rollback directory. That data is not lost. We put it in a special directory, and we leave it there for you to check. Now, why do we leave it there for you to check? What, uh, like a, a lot of uh, engineers, when they're starting to do the trains and stuff, they'll say, well, why don't you just push it back onto the new primary? What would be the problem with that? How long has my primary been down? Three hours? What's my data type? What, what type of data am I using? Let's say that I've had subsequent um, writes to the primary that once the secondary comes back up, all of a sudden it's overwriting it with data that was two hours ago, right? So um, in reconciling data like that, there's, uh, there's two kinds of ideas behind that. There's semantic reconciliation uh, and syntactic re reconciliation. Syntactic reconciliation is I can clearly see that this data is an ancestor of this data. So I can just get rid of it. I can see the causal chain. That's easy to do, right? Semantic reconciliation is saying, 
I have two versions of the data, and it's not clear to me which one's the right one. And that will require, in every case, on every database, that will require uh, an engineer to say, like, ah, I see it. The way that I often uh, put it in, in trainings is, like, let's say that you have a collision or uh, in your CMS, right? Or, excuse me, CDS. Or um, uh, GitHub, you have a, a collision on, on two, two files, right? You have to reconcile that yourself as the engineer to understand, um, to get the two versions of the code to gel. Would anybody trust an automatic code uh, reconciliation scheme? I wouldn't. So <laughs> it's the same same idea, right? Now, um, what's interesting about that is some some people say, well, use the you do it the last. What's a what's a way of automatically determining which is the most recent piece of data? The timestamp, right? So you can timestamp data. The problem is, is that you get into clock skew, right? Clock skew is not always in sync, right? And who, like Einstein used to say, is a man with one watch knows what time it is, a man with two watches has no idea. It's like, where, who set the clock, uh, or who's recording which, um, and what's the clock skew between them? It could be the case that you're overwriting a, a more recent data write uh, that um, uh, simply because the clock skew is off by 100 milliseconds, 500 milliseconds. In some cases, if they're not using NTP, it could be off by several seconds. So. Um, the safest way of doing it is to save the data and not force it back into the system. It's a good question. Yeah. Hi, a question. Uh, question of uh, Frank from Brazil would also like to measure their waves. Uh, obviously, they're not using feet. If you use complex types, uh, would that also still work with the analytics framework, or does that require primitive numeric data, as we saw in your example? Um, I was just thinking about this case today because I was thinking like the way I'd, I'd like to take it beyond the hypothetical and actually put it up on GitHub and have, I'm try, I don't know that a surf reporting application is good. I want people to contribute and, and use it and, and, and play with it and I want it to touch every aspect. So in this case, I, I, I would say that the, 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 the correct thing to do is if you're going to report it in dimension, I would do it in metric in this case. Um, and then you, you interpret it differently, <coughs> location based, locality based. Uh, in the application layer. Thank you, Carl, because I'm working with friends also for her own interpretation of the term that are dealing with those kinds of problems. Right. Oops. Pleasure. So, in, uh, yes, please. In the, in the, in the example, will it, uh, the case will you show the tag? example of tagging the region, does that automatically imply a shard a shortage? No, um, uh, that can be within, that's just on a node basis within a replica set. Although we do have tag aware sharding. And um, now, that gets, it's not, none of this stuff you'll, you'll see is that complicated, but there's nuances to it, right? So the important thing of what I was saying is that MongoDB distributes load by distributing data. The first thing I want to say about that is, is load always associated with data size? No, not necessarily, right? You can have mounds and mounds of data that's cold, right? That's why the shard key and knowing how you how you query is so important on the key. Um, to really optimize it, you have to understand the way that you want to access your data. There's total flexibility. It doesn't mean you're prohibited from ad hoc queries, but to get the big performance boost that everybody loves, you got to understand the query. Now, MongoDB distributes load by distributing data. But there are certain, we introduced in version 2.2 tag aware shard. The idea was, is that I've got one primary taking all the rights in my Los Angeles data center. But my data app, my application server is in Hong Kong, right? So what's the, what's the halfway around the world light speed is 186 milliseconds or something like that. I forget what it is, but the latency could be quite large. I can't tolerate that, right? Wouldn't it be awesome to have a sharded system where my, where my primaries were always close to my application servers? So the idea was with tagware sharding, or what we call geo sharding, is that you, you create a shard key that contains um, geo-specific information in it, such that you, you're directing workloads. Tags are all about assigning workload to nodes. In this case, you're directing workloads specific to your data center close to shards that have primaries there. 
the rest of the replica set can be everywhere else in the world, right? So you have disaster recovery, but the primary is in, in the Hong Kong data center, right? So that's tag aware sharding. Now the, 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 the idea with that is, is that before we're distributing our data across all the shards, now we're partitioning data and assigning some of that data over to the two specific shards. So it's like a step just a little bit back from this distribute as far as you can to a kind of cluster where you need to. The, um, the upshot is, is that you lower latency on writes, or you might have a hot set of data that you can define on the shard key and assign to your most recent best hardware and you might have an archive range of data that can live on older hardware, right? We have a large gaming company that does exactly that for their older online games. They never updated their hardware because the game popularity went down, so they never had to. But for their harder games that require lots of, of um, throughput and state changes, that they've used sharding to assign um, the hot set to hot hardware. So. That's, that's a reasonably complex uh, uh, idea in, in 10 seconds, but an excellent question. Yeah? What is the grand life level of uh, consistency and durability level? So is it like per collection or per? Yes, it's per operation actually. And, I, and I'm sorry I neglected to mention that. So I was setting kind of a default on the connection, right? So what you can do is override the default at the connection level, at the Mongo client level. But you can also say on, uh, per database, per, and then below that you can say per collection, per operations even. So I might have um, certain operations that I want to have different read preferences than other operations on the same data type. Uh, and then it, also with the right concerns as well. So maximum flexibility. Good question. Yeah? I was a little confused about the sample code and the primary secondary election process. Yeah. Uh, No, it's, it's handled at the database level. In fact, let me show you, bingo. Um, so right now you can see that this guy that I'm in is in secondary mode, right? So what I'm going to do is go rs.conf. Well, first of all, I'm going to say rs.status. What is my replica set status, right? And it tells me who the secondaries are, who the primary is. Um, it tells me the date of the operation. You'll see here the op time date. This is the last operation executed in the op log, right? Up there. And then down here, you'll see op time date on the secondary. If they're the same, the, there's no lag right now, right? Because the operation times are the same. This is the state of the system. Now, you're asking about configuration. So rs.conf, within it, I just happened to write, that was the order that I created the server list in the client that bears no relevance as to who's going to be the primary. Um, here is where it is on the server. This is on the server system now. You'll notice that I there are my tags, first of all, where I'm saying data center and region. You'll notice that I have this thing called priority two. See that right there? He has a higher priority, boy, I should have talked into this more. Um, he has a higher priority than his siblings. In fact, his siblings have a priority of zero. Priority of zero means that they'll never become the primary. I'm, I'm explicitly saying that they will be members of the replica set. They can vote for the primary. They can't, they're not a candidate to become the primary. Um, in, in this case, priority two indicates that I, I set him a higher priority than anybody else. This is actually kind of a muddled configuration because I was using it to demonstrate, but yeah. Right, so, so when you, uh, like the example code again, when you list the server, you have to at least include one primary server. No, it'll discover it. It'll, it'll discover it. It, 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 when it. You're just giving it a, a seed list of servers in the replica set. You're not saying who the primary is. And then it says, OK, um, I'm going to connect to these guys, and I'm going to issue an is master command. So part of my initialization is, can I connect to these guys? And they say, great, you're the first member uh, that I can connect to. Who is the master? And he says, like, hey, it happens to be me. Or it could say, like, uh, it's not me, it's this guy, and here are the other members of the set that you don't know about, that are not in your seed list. So, so let's say you have server for 100, right? Mm -hmm. And let's say you only listed three. Yeah. And all three goes down, right? 
Yeah, yeah you, you wouldn't. Yeah, the, no, 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 no. The client will have auto discovered those guys before. You're only giving it a seed list. You're only giving it a couple of servers. The weird thing about the the, the that's a good question, by the way. But the 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 um, the, uh, uh, the client the driver will say, you're telling me that there's at least these two nodes within the replica set. And because you're giving me a seed list of greater than one, I know that I should get the full report from the nodes, right? Uh, all, every member in the replica set knows about every other member of the replica set. So if I can contact one, I know to ask it, right? Um, if, if I only gave it one, it's going to assume that it's a single node setup. Giving it two or greater lets it know it could be a, a replica set of n numbers. So it says, hey guys, give me the full skinny, right? By the way, it'll also say, um, hey, are you a single replica set or are, am I talking to a Mongo S? Because if I'm talking to a Mongo S, I know that um, I, I need to get more information, different types of information. Excellent question. Excellent question. Yeah, but the order that they occurred in there, there's no relevance on what the roles actually are within the replica set. More questions? These are good questions. You guys are smart. What is the most common problem that you see at client side? Um, most com uh, they're they're not indexing as well as they could, right? They they might be over indexed. Um, it's it's they're, they're common problems or there's there's like fundamental stuff that they probably MongoDB is not hard. Nothing that I presented here is hard, right? Uh, like I say, it's not hard. It's there's nuances to it. So the big problems that I see is that they might have a um, two MongoDB instances on the same server. And you wouldn't want to do that because you're going to have, it on a single disk, two databases with two random patterns that are going to create competition on the, on the stylus, on this disk seats. That's one thing that you wouldn't want to do. And that's usually easy. So like, you'll get better performance if you have two separate servers. Um, indexing mistakes. So uh, if you're going to do a compound index, um, you, they get the order backwards, right? Like, Say, for instance, I, I was recording student um, student test scores. If I wanted to find out who had the highest test score using a compound index, and I created the index with scores by student, right? Um, I would get the highest score and then find out who the student was. If I wanted to get the highest, uh, uh, or if I wanted to find out who the student was that had the highest score. If I wanted to find out who, what, the highest score per student was, I'd rearrange the index, right? Because if you think of the way that the table is, is being created, um, I'm searching it in a different way. The index, the student names are going to be alphabetical, right? And that doesn't bear relevance on who has the absolute highest score, right? Both are relevant kind of queries. I might want to know who had who had the highest score, period. But I want to I might want to find out what were the scores per student, right? So that would require two different indexes, right? So. Is that a problem because the programmers have to fake database design now where they didn't have to use Uh, Yeah, only slightly. And you know, actually, you just read my mind. The other kind of issue is, is that we have this left brain, right brain division in databases previously, prior to non-relational databases, where you have your DBA, DB guy, and then you have your apps house, right? As you can tell with MongoDB, that those divisions are a little bit more blurred. You need to have the full house talking to each other. There's still, nobody should be afraid that they're being obsolesced. It's just you're getting your full development team working together because what your app, application guy does is gonna affect performance on the, on the database side. And the database guy, the administrator does, the IT guy even, will, will um, needs to talk to the application developer. Why? Let's, let's take read aheads. How many people know what a read ahead is? Read ahead is like when you do a disk operation, you say, okay, I'm, I'm gonna get this, I'm gonna get this block of data, right? But I happen to know that I should probably read ahead on disk and get four more. Right? Works really well for paging and operating systems, right? But not in databases because you're usually saying, I want that record, I want that record, I want that record. If you're doing read read aheads that are too great, then you're you're pulling extra stuff that you won't use. So we, we, we are, uh, part of what we do is uh, called a health check, where I just did two this week. You go into an office and you say, well, let me, let me see what your read-ahead settings are. And if your read-ahead settings are far in excess of what your average document size is, you're, you're wasting IOPS. 
the, the, and those are kind of simple problems to fix, right? They're common, but uh, they're not hard to fix. So um, in terms of the way the indexes work, um, could you contrast them with uh, a clustered index in the traditional SQL database? Yeah, I, I, you could. I mean, we're, we're B trees, right? And so some people, we, we our indexes are B trees, so they're, they're, some people consider B trees to be a clustered index. But some people would also say that clustered indexes are, are more specific than just that. So um, I, I would say I, I would have to plead a little bit of ignorance on that and say I don't know. I couldn't confidently answer that correctly. Okay. Um, does, to, to, to your point about reading ahead, um, because if you're reading an index in a traditional SQL database, you're going to, you, you are going to read ahead because of the locality of the index. Well, the, the way that MongoDB stores its indexes it, it is that they're interleaved with the data records themselves in the file system, right? So there's not necessarily, even though they're logically ordered and maintained in memory, pages and page outs on the, on the actual nodes themselves will be different. They won't be contiguous in that sense. Okay, so does that mean there's no equivalent of a re-indexing operation? There is. Um, there is. Uh, so what you can do is a compaction on a database that you can rebuild indexes, you can write compactions or total repairs on the database. Um, the problem is, is that unless you are disallowing writes during that operation, your, your likeliness of getting contiguity on disk is less because the, the insert, you, you don't know what the insert um, pattern could be. Uh, um, you, you could get it if you if you cordon it off and you said nobody can write to this while I perform this compaction, then you get continuity. But the idea being is that um, since we're, we're going to cache everything in memory, we're trying to uh, we're trying to minimize <coughs> disk seat impact on performance by doing that. That's a good question. Now, one thing is that you can set the read ahead too low because um, let's say that we're we're doing. Um, we have 8K um, blocks for uh, the, the uh, index nodes, right? So if you set your uh, index, uh, your read ahead too low, you have to do two operations back to get the full index node, and that's very bad performance. You wouldn't want to do that. It's a good question. So, uh, last question. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned sharding, uh, the database automatically sharded. So if you query an ID which was, was not sharded on, so who does the combination of that, the Mongo server, the client? Yeah, so the Mongo server, uh, the Mongo server says like, is there any component of the shard key that I can derive? Meaning that I'm gonna try and avoid a scatter gather. That, that's, if I can't locate the specific shard that the data is on, maybe I can locate a set of shards that it's on. If I can't, I've gotta issue the request out to every single, um, every single shard. Now, that's effectively, you haven't really scaled your, your writes or your reads that way because you're, you're, you're sending the, the data load to all shards. Um, it will still use indexes once it gets there, if there's secondary indexes that it can. Um, but you'll be limited to the, the result time, will be limited to the shard that has the highest latency, right? So your, your performance is limited to the, the shard that takes the longest to respond off of that query. Good question.